Hello and welcome to the last lesson on electricity. In this lesson we're going to be looking at electrostatic fields. It's a triple science lesson so if you're doing combined science you don't need to do this one. My name is Mr Pratt, Director of Science. For the lesson you're going to need the usual pen, paper on exercise book, a pencil would also help actually because we've got some diagrams of electric fields that we're going to be drawing. Unless you're needing to watch this video on your mobile phone, turn it off, get it on silent, get it out of the way, try and avoid as many distractions as you can. On to the starter then, I'm going to give you two minutes. We're going to look back at circuit symbols, which was the first lesson in the electricity topic. It also came up in year seven and eight. See how many of these you can recall. If you finish in time, there's a couple missing that I'll later draw those as well. A minute left, there's two missing on there, if you can remember them, draw them, a light emitting diode and a thermistor. So you've done, if you mark the top row first, we've got ammeter, cell, a battery, a battery that's made out of two cells and a diode. Remember cell, if you're in a prison cell, you've got one room. A cell is one, battery means many. Down to the second row, fuse, lamp, resistor and a variable resistor. If you'd done the thermistor, it looks very similar to the variable resistor, but instead of it being an arrow, it's a line that's got a little bit at the bottom, which looks like a hockey stick thermistor. Last line, light dependent resistor, an open switch, that's off, a closed switch, that's on, and a voltmeter. If you'd done the LED as well, it's exactly the same as the diode with a couple of arrows pointing away from it to show that there's light coming off it. Let's look at the outcomes again. First thing we're going to do is describe how the distance between charge objects affects the force between them. And the other outcome, as well as drawing some examples of electrostatic fields, which you could be asked to do in the exam, we're going to use our understanding of what a field is to explain certain phenomena like sparking and a couple of other things that I'm going to show you with the Van de Graaff demo. Now, I'm going to look at gravitational fields first, even though you don't need to do them for the exam and it's not on the specification. You don't need to know them, but I think that it's easier to understand a gravitational field than it is electrostatic or magnetic because we've got more experience of gravity. So if I show you a gravitational field, you should be able to then improve your understanding of fields in physics in general. So we've got the Earth. Let's say that we went a good distance away the Earth's surface and we got a brick. 
we let go of that brick, you'll all be able to describe the way that it will fall. It will experience a force towards the centre of the earth. That's the force that's on it. If you put a brick in a different place, put a brick over there, it'll still experience a force towards the centre of the earth. No matter where I put the brick, it's going to experience a force towards the centre of the earth. That looks very similar to the way that we represent a gravitational field. So we draw a gravitational field like that. So we've got lots of lines pointing towards the centre of the earth. So if you had to draw that, you would stick your ruler in the centre of the earth and then you draw it. The arrows represent the force on an object with mass that we put there because it's a gravitational field and gravitational fields affect mass. So the lines, there's two things that they tell us. They tell us the direction of the force, so it's always towards the centre of the earth. But also they tell you more. The closer that the lines are together, the stronger the field is. So if you've got an object that's very close to the earth, it experiences quite a strong gravitational field. But if, as you move away, the lines get further apart, so the force on an object gets less. So the force of gravity decreases as you move away from the Earth. We should now be able to use our understanding of gravitational fields to look at electrostatic fields or electric fields. All a field is in physics is a way of describing the forces around an object. Later on, year 10, year 11, you'll look at magnetic fields. <coughs> and if you study A-level, you'll come across gravitational fields and you'll look at the more detailed maths describing how they work. We represent the forces using field lines. They tell us two things. Direction of the force using the arrows, as we would with vectors. And the magnitude, the size of the force. The closer the field lines are together, then the greater the force is. So here we've got the electrostatic field around a positively charged isolated sphere, uh, sphere. Let's just break that down a bit. So positively charged means that it's lost electrons. So electrons have been removed and because we've removed negative charges, we're left with a positive charge. Isolated sphere means it's not con uh, connected with a conductor to the ground. If it was connected to the ground with a conductor, the electrons would just flow up from the ground and it would never end up getting an overall charge. Now this could be the dome of the Van de Graaff generator that we're going to have a look at. That will get a positive charge because the belt removes electrons from the dome. I want you to quickly sketch that field. It's important. It's also important that you're drawing your lines so that they appear to come from the centre. It's called a radial, a radial field. If you imagine you've got a bicycle wheel, it's like the spokes coming out from the centre. So I want you to draw that. Then I want you to label where the field is strongest on there. You could put where it's weaker as well. And then if we could get a positively charged piece of cereal, so a little tiny bit of, bit of the cornflake or something, and you place that in the field, what direction would the force be on it? I'm just, I'm not going to put the timer on. I'm just going to give you about 45, 60 seconds to do that. It shouldn't take too long. When you're drawing the field as well in an exam, you don't need to do as many radial lines as long as they're coming out of the, the centre and they've got arrows on, that's fine. Right, she's almost done. Point to remember, the field lines in an electrostatic field go from positive to negative. When we get to magnets, they go from north to south. So here we've got positive to negative. So because this insulated or isolated sphere 
has got a positive charge, the field lines are coming off the positive, they're moving away from the positive. The field lines, they'll just be strongest as close to the surface as the sphere as you can get. So you should have labeled somewhere near the surface of the sphere. The field will be weaker as you move further away. If you put a positively charged piece of cereal in there, the force will be in the direction of those field arrows. So it should be moving away to be forced away from the surface of the sphere. What that field shows you there around that charged sphere is the direction of the force if you were to get a positive charge and pop it in there. So the positive charge would move away because like charges repel. So it's always convention. It's supposed to represent the force on a little positive charge if we put it in there. So we've got the field around a positively charged sphere then. If I get a positive charge and I pop it there, what the field will show us, it will show us the direction of the force on that positive charge when I put it in the field. And because it's repelled, it'll move along the field lines like that. An electrostatic field then shows the direction of a force on a positive charge. That's why it goes from the plus towards a minus. What I want to do now is very quickly try drawing the field lines around that negative isolated sphere. Just give you one minute. Sure you're using a ruler, make sure you've got a direction. See how you've done. You should have lines like spokes, so it's radius, so they all should appear to be coming from the centre. And it, remember, it shows the direction that a positive would move in that field. So this time it's towards the minus. You always do the lines from the plus to the minus. Next one then, one minute. You might have to be drawing this one slightly more freehand. It's a bit more like a bar magnet field, if you can remember that from lower down school. Save done. So the lines go from the positive to the negative and they curve round. If you see, if you move further up or down the picture, you'll see that the field lines are starting to get further apart. As you move further away, up and down, the field will get weaker. And if you put a positive charge in there to be pushed away from the positive and towards the negative, that's what the field lines are showing you. Next one. One minute.
on this one, you might want to think what would happen if I put a positive charge right in the middle of those two? What force would it experience if it was right in the middle of those two? See how you've managed. So the field lines come out of the positive. If you just think about what one sphere would look like, most of the diagram is just like the way that we've drawn the field around a positive isolated sphere. But in the middle, if you were to place a positively charged particle, another little tiny sphere, charged bubble, and you could get it right in the middle of those two, it would experience no force because it would be cancelled out. It would be repelled from both so you've got no field lines in the middle. That's what that gap is. It's showing you that there's no field, so no force between the two. Well done if you've got anything like that. Progress check then. Going to give you a total of four minutes. Field around a positively charged isolated sphere. Describe how the force on a positively charged speck of dust in the field changes with distance. Then draw the field around two close but isolated negatively charged spheres. Describe the force on the positively charged speck of dust in three different places in the field. So quite a lot. Do your best. Good luck. Just a minute left.
you've done. First one, self-assess it as we go along. Need the diagram, positively charged isolated sphere, hoping you've got the idea of this now. So the field lines are coming away from it and they should be pointing towards the centre of the circle as you draw it. Make sure you've got arrows. That'd be worth two marks in the exam. And what happens with the distance? As the distance from the sphere increases, the force decreases. Take them on. Two close but isolated negatively charged spheres. The field lines are going to be going into negatively charged spheres. And we've still got that gap in the middle. That gap in the middle where the field is cancelling out. So the three places that I decided to pick, I picked A further away, B slap bang in the middle and C closer to the sphere on the left. At A then, there'll be a weak force towards that nearest sphere. At B, if I've got it right exactly in the middle there, there'll be no force because there's no field lines. And point C, strong force towards the nearest negative sphere. So it'd be attracted to that negative sphere. Well done if you did quite well. We're going to look now at the Van de Graaff generator. If we explain first how it works, these can be all sorts of sizes. You can get mini ones and you can get absolutely huge ones. So the top of the dome ends up with, in the end, a positive charge. Now remember, we don't talk about positive charges moving. We've got a belt, like a conveyor belt that you might find in the supermarket, that's going up on one side and down on the other, and that's connect connected to the dome at the top and the base at the bottom. So the first thing that happens is electrons are rubbed from the dome by the top of the belt by friction. So as the belt rubs at the top there, it rubs electrons off. We've got two different materials rubbing on each other. The extra electrons then travel down the rubber belt and then they get rubbed off onto the base. So you end up with lots of extra electrons on the base that have come from the dome at the top. The dome gains a positive charge the base gains a negative charge and if you've got a good day and the air in the room is quite dry and you leave it charging for a few minutes you can get quite a lot of charge that can be equivalent of hundreds of thousands of volts um, potential difference between the dome at the top and the base at the bottom and then we can use it to show some interesting experiments with static electricity first thing we're going to have a look at with the van de Graaff generator <laughs> is how it can produce sparks Got a diagram there, top of the dome becomes positive and then connected another metal sphere with a Y to the bottom. So we have a positively charged dome and a negatively charged sphere next to it. We can see sparks between the small sphere and the big dome as electrons move up the wire and jump across the gap. Let's have a look closely at what a spark looks like. Electrons moving through the air heat the air up air is not a very good conductor so it emits light and sound. You can see here there's enough current to light up a fluorescent tube as electrons jump and flow through the tube. I'm going to give you a minute then, just three quick questions for you to do. Say what sparks are explain using what you know about electrostatic fields how the sparks were produced and if the dome of the generator becomes positively charged which way are the electrons moving during the spark Just 10 seconds left then. It's 
sparks then. So you should have written something to do with electrons flowing through air for that. It's basically an electric current through air. Explain using what you know about electrostatic fields, how the sparks are produced. Electrons are rubbed from one place to another, so we get a large number of electrons in one place, electrons missing, a positive charge in the other place, which gives you potential difference. And then if the potential difference is big enough, you'll get a current. If the dome becomes positively charged, which way are the electrons moving? Well, they'll be moving to the dome, coming up from the base to the little smaller sphere and then jumping across to the dome because the dome is positive. I'm going to look at now using the Van de Graaff generator to show some different repulsion, including flying pie cases. So you get the pie cases, you stack them on top of the Van de Graaff generator. So initially everything has got a neutral charge, same number of protons and electrons, and then you switch it on. As soon as you switch on the Van de Graaff generator, the pie cases fly off with the top case coming off first. The bottom cases are held down by the weight, so they come off one at a time. You notice the smaller bun cases come up a lot quicker than the, the bigger ones. Here just some polystyrene beads being repelled, and then a bit of cotton, could be someone's hair if you could get them to stand with the hand on the Van de Graaff generator isolated, all showing repulsion. We'll give you a minute then, describe what happens to the pie cases, explain what happens to the pie cases. So that's science, describes what you saw, explain is the science behind what you saw. And then the last one, use forces to explain how the plastic cup at the end of the clip floated in the air. Finishing off. First one simple describe what happened to the pie cases. They were repelled and lifted off the top of the dome one at a time. Explain what happens. The dome gets a positive charge because it's less uh, lost electrons. So the pie cases get a positive charge because they've lost electrons as well. Pie case is positive. Dome is positive, so they're repelled. And they come off one at a time because the weight is keeping them down, so they just leave one at a time. Use forces to explain how the plastic cup at the end of the clip floated in the air. It will have been, the plastic cup will have been positive, the dome will have been positive, so we get a force of repulsion. If the cup was floating in the air, the force of repulsion must have been equal and opposite to the force of gravity trying to pull it down. Last one then, I'm going to have a look at lighting a Bunsen burner using static electricity. You may have, if you've got a gas um, hob on the oven, you may have a button that you hold down that clicks, produces static electricity, you get a spark and that'll light the gas. So it's a very similar principle. So I'm hoping to show you a use of static electricity, a static lighter, and get you to think about the potential dangers of static electricity as well, which we saw in the previous lesson. There's a limited amount of educational content in this, but what I plan to do is, is to light the Bunsen burner using the Van de Graaff generator. I have done this before, getting students to get charged and then move the finger towards the Bunsen burner. All I've got here is Van de Graaff generator, charged positive, connected to the smaller dome, so that's positive. And then the base of the Bunsen burner, I've just connected that back to the bottom. So as this becomes negative, that'll become positive so the bunsen burner will become negative 
the smaller dome will become positive. If I've got enough of a strength electric field there, electrons will jump up from the Bunsen burner to make a spark. Heat the air should be enough to light the Bunsen burner. If I turn the gas on at the right time, you can hear it clicking like a cooker lighter. Right, oh, there you go, perfect. Let's try it again with a bit of a bigger spark. I'll put the lights off this time. Hopefully that way you'll actually see the spark. I don't know if you can see that there. Just on the bottom there it is. A bit closer. Spark. Just need the spark to catch the gas. There you go. Oh, they blew it out. Brilliant. There you go. So that's the use of static electricity. You've possibly got a cooker, you've got a button that you press, generate static electricity, and then that spark is near your gas as an automatic lighter. Right, one minute then. Number one, if the dome of the generator becomes positively charged, which way do the electrons move during the spark? And second one, explain a situation where a spark caused by static electricity may be dangerous. If the dome's positively charged, that means electrons will go from negative to positive, so the electrons move from the smaller sphere to the dome. Second one, explain a situation where a spark caused by static electricity may be dangerous. Refueling your car or refueling a plane, in a flower factory or a sawmill where there's lots of very small particles in the air that could be explosive. Okay, so any situation where something may be explosive that's around you and precautions would have to be make, made in that particular place to avoid the spark. Quite often that would involve earthing. If you earth something the charge can't build up because it'll flow, the electrons will either flow to the earth or from the earth depending on whether the object is becoming positively or negatively charged. Exam question then, two minutes, off you go.
Just a few seconds left. Self-assess it then, out of three marks. This content that I've shown you and the questions that I've asked you have been quite repetitive. There's not much that they can ask you. So as long as you can draw these field diagrams and they can explain what happens with the force as you move further away from a charged object, you'll get the marks. It's relatively straightforward, but if you've not got it, you, you're gonna be in trouble. So we've got to draw the field lines. It's worth two marks. So we need an arrow that's pointing away and it needs to be coming or appearing to come from the centre. If you've not drawn it from the centre, that's fine, but it should, it should look like it's coming from the centre. Doesn't matter how many you draw, you probably need to do two or three in the exam and that'll be enough. So if you've drawn those just coming away from the surface, that's absolutely fine. And for part B, all you've got to do is, is to look at which one of those points is closest to the dome, because the one that's closest to the dome will experience the greatest force, and that's Q. Quick plenary quiz then, one minute, write down the units for those six quantities. If you've finished, jot energy down. So you've done, so we've got charges coulombs, capital C. Current amps or amperes, capital A. Potential difference, volts, capital V. Power, watts, capital W. Resistance, ohms, capital Greek letter omega and time is seconds, small letter S. If you've done, if you've done energy, that's joules, capital J. Gonna leave you with a summary then. Got some different field diagrams for you. At the bottom, a quick note on what, what the field lines show you and how, to, how you draw them. If you need to get anything, into your notes now from that summary, just pause the video and get them, get them joined down. That's it for electricity, that's all I've done. So I'll see you again, this time for a different topic.